welcome to uh, this webinar hosted by NIDE. My name is Dino Nocciveri, I'm going to be the chair of today's event and we're looking into abuse in sport um, and the title of, of the webinar is, is Sport Safe? Stamping out abuse in sport. So just to start off with, you know, we, we have to be careful and we're going to issue a, a trigger warning that we are going to be discussing abuse in, in numerous different forms of its sexual, physical, emotional and racial. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who has signed up and who's attending. As you can see from the initial slide, the hashtag today is going to be hashtag abuse in sport. Be really grateful if you could share it on you know, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. We really are keen to raise awareness of this issue. The people we've got today, um, this is a rough agenda. We've got um, Baroness Tanya Gray Thompson talking um, about what changes are needed to improve safeguarding to better protect athletes and what's been done within Parliament at the moment to tackle abuse. We've then got Troy Townsend um, from Kick It Out talking about the extents and the issue of racial abuse within football and the need for improved support for survivors. We've then got Mari McClanahan from uh, Kaniska, um, an athlete herself, um, who'll be talking about her personal experience of the um, justice system and the work she's doing with Kaniska to try to improve safeguarding for female athletes and for all athletes. And then we've got Eloise Joktiski, um, an abuse survivor within gymnastics. We're talking about the good and part, bad aspects of her experience of going through the, um, the issues with British gymnastics, what needs to change as well. Finally, after all of that, we'll have a Q&A session, which will be for all of the speakers. And I'll be really grateful if you could send in your questions throughout um, we'll deal with the questions at the end, but if you could, when you're sending them in, please also say which speaker you'd like to, for, um, for him to answer it. And then finally, a bit closing note by me. So to start off with who I am, um, so my name is Dino Rocciavelli. I'm a, a solicitor and a partner in the abuse team at Lido. I specialise in representing abuse victims and survivors. Um, and... Alongside being a lawyer, I do a lot of uh, media work and campaign for change um, through different aspects. I'm London based, we've got clients all over the country, all over the globe, and this issue isn't about one sport. And I, you know, just with the first slide, um, it's not just in football, it's not just in gymnastics, it's on every sport. And that's what's really good from the people who've attended today. We've got representatives from football, rugby, tennis, athletics, cycling, UK sport, Sport England, UK coaching, gymnastics, basketball, swimming, cricket, and the list goes on. And it's really good to see that kind of engagement. And we really hope you can learn from attending today and, and take something away from it. It's noted that there are no representatives from martial arts which are attending today, which is disappointing. And it's an issue which we see in our casework, whereby it's so disjointed that safeguarding of athletes is, is a real problem in martial arts. It's not perfect in other sports, but especially in martial arts, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, I wanted to talk about um, the independent inquiry into childhood sexual abuse. Independent inquiry into childhood sexual abuse was set up in 2015. So ICSA was set up in 2015, due to be published next month. And as you can see, the amount of money which has been invested is, is significant. And the idea is to raise awareness of abuse and to um, highlight um, issues and what needs to be changed to prevent abuse ideally in the future. And the total expenditure is about £180 million, which is a significant sum. And the areas which are covering um, is 15 investigation strands. As you can see, it goes from um, religious institutions to residential schools to um, child sexual exploitation by organized networks. There's a wide range of areas which I've looked into. You will notice that it doesn't cover sport. Um, and that's a huge issue. And it's a huge gap to be missed. I've raised this personally with uh, independent inquiry. And I've also raised it through the media on numerous occasions. Instead of looking into um, sport is a separate investigation strand. They did a thematic approach whereby they looked into nine of the 64 complaints which came forward. Now, 
that isn't sufficient in my view, and it is a missed opportunity. And, and just to prove that point, in the 16 months after Andy Woodward came forward and disclosed his sexual abuse at the hands of his football coach, Barry Bernal, he disclosed in November 2016, Operation Hydrant, the police um, body, noted that nearly 900 potential victims of survivors came forward. There were 300 alleged suspects of abuse and about 340 football clubs were implicated. Not, not any of that's going to be covered by the independent inquiry, which has nearly spent nearly you know, 200 million on this issue. It's a missed opportunity to investigate this important area and to better protect children. And that's the reason why this webinar has been born because we need to look into this issue and to delve into why does abuse take place? How can we stop it? How can we better protect survivors once they are um, disclosed to us or we're aware of the issue? Now that's a, a very brief introduction of the issue. The first person to be talking will be Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, um, who um, I've wrote down some of your attributes actually, Tani, because there are numerous of them. Um, her Paralympic records, 11 golds, four silvers, one bronze, added to five gold, four silvers, three bronze medals at the World Championships, won the London uh, wheelchair marathon six times, broke over 30 world records over her career. Um, apart from being a Welsh icon and a national icon within sport, she then decided to become an independent crossbench peer in the House of Lords um, and has devoted her life really to progressing the welfare and protection of athletes. She's spoken on a number of different issues um, and we've worked together on positions of trust and also managed reporting. And I hand over now to Baroness Tani Gray Thompson um, to talk. Thanks Dino uh, and thank you so much for inviting me. And, and also thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, it's really great to see so many people uh, joining in the conversation. Um, and discussion, as Dino said, we've we've worked together over a number of years, um, and thank you for your counsel. I also know there's quite a few people online who've who've supported me in my work on duty care. And one of the reasons I've got involved, I competed for a long time, 25 years from beginning to end, and have worked in sport before and since. Um, I'm passionate about sport, and there's a lot of really good stuff it can do, but we also have to be um, honest and open about the challenges. Uh, that it brings. And I think for me, the biggest change that I've seen in the last few years is that people are more able to talk about some of these challenges and solutions. I think there's always been a bit of fear um, from, from some governing bodies about saying that there are issues. Um, and my experience is the vast majority of people I speak to want to do the right thing, um, just not all of them know how to do it within the system and within the funding mechanisms and with the desire to be successful uh, about sport. Now, there are no simple answers to some of this, um, but actually it's really important that we take a whole system approach to it. And for me, it's not about knocking down sports. Um, you know, I'm passionate about the things that sport and physical activity can do, but I think that we can do better. Now, I started competing in the 80s and, you know, some of the discussions around balance and elite sport and duty of care sort of happened then. Um, actually, in the, the modern world of, of sport and desire to win medals and funding, um, these are bigger discussions that we have. And we have to spend more time and effort to make sure that it works out. And a lot of what I do around is now at the moment is looking at how you balance the commitment that's needed to be an elite athlete uh, and, and also the support that's required from coaches and how you build a life outside sport because elite sport is, is not like anything else that I've ever worked in. I'm not sure you can make it all warm and cuddly. Uh, and and I'm, I've been accused of, you know, wanting to, you know, just make it so easy that nothing ever happens. Absolutely not. You know, I, I recognize that elite sport um, has, has to be challenging, but also it's about understanding. And I'm really keen on, is it about everyone in the system? I've seen uh, athletes, coaches, physios, you know, people who have been treated poorly by the system. And I think it's really important. Um, when I originally got asked to do my piece of work for the government on duty of care, um, the government were asking me to look at participants as in athletes 
And for me, participants is everyone in the system because everyone contributes to the culture um, that we we currently have. Now, I think there were some things, and certainly in the early years in my competing, it was easier because there was no money. Nobody had any money. Uh, and we have to recognise the pressure has changed uh, in terms of, of what we expect from our athletes. Because, no, we don't longer just expect our athletes to be athletes. We expect them to be role models and an arbiter of social conscience. And we 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 put loads of pressure on, on athletes to do things more than ever before. But if I look back, you know, the, the good things about sport, Nelson Mandela says sport has the power to change the world. And I think sport has the power to do loads of things. But we also have to recognise that culture ebbs and flows and changes. And the reality is athletes, coaches, people who work in sport don't come and tell me that they're having a great time. That That's not you know what they do. So the people who come to me tend to be the people who feel they have nowhere else to go to or they have uh, big issues that they, they want to, to deal with. And so I do try really hard to make sure that the views I have are balanced in terms of going out and me finding people who are having a better experience. Because again, I think it's important to, to, to not just um, be seen to be the person who's grumpy about the system all the time. Um, and I think, you know, if we look at where our system is now, uh, it's easy to look back to 96 and the single gold medal from Redgrave and Pinsent and this massive desire for change to, to, to be better. And I sat on UK Sport in the late 90s when the Lottery Act changed. I was part of the system that evolved in, in the early years. Uh, and if I look back, you know, when we bid for the 2000 Games, I'm really glad we never got it, uh, although it wasn't such a good thing at the time. But it actually allowed us time to embed uh, an elite performance system that had a chance of success. Now, 10 years on from London, it was amazing and incredible games uh, to, to witness. There's a couple of things. It didn't change the world for disabled people, even though it was great Paralympics. But also, uh, I think what happened in the desire to be seen uh, and to be a really good nation, a set of behaviours developed, which if they'd just been around the 2012 games may have been OK, but actually they became really hard to dial back from, especially when not just wanting to do well in 2012, we then announced as a country, and lots of people bought into this, that we wanted to be the first country to bounce on the back of Olympics and Paralympics and do well, not just be the country that did well at home games and then disappeared um, away and, and dropped back down the medal table. The reality, I think, is that uh, the number of medals um, are important to a number of people. Actually, to the public at large, they think about moments. They remember moments in time where they saw something like a sport they'd never watched before or someone they loved who, who did incredible, or somebody who wasn't expected to do well. And it's how we balance that uh, key performance indicators and targets and number of medals with actually the wider issue of the public want us, us to do well. Because there is a cost to this, not just a financial cost. And over the years, We've worked out cost per gold medal and cost, per, you know, you, you can cut data loads, loads of different ways. But there is a cost to the people in the system. And I am uh, believe that we have to understand the, the price that is paid. Um, and, you know, some athletes will find it worth it and some won't. And it's it's not just the financial cost. It's the physical, the psychological, the, the mental cost to it. Now, for me, the price I paid for competing was worth it. Uh, because uh, I had a lot of balance in my life as an athlete. I had amazing people around me who were my critical friends and supported me, who enabled me to transition out. Um, the price to be paid in other countries for competing well is very different from what we would deem to be acceptable. You look at Russia and, um, you know, the forcing athletes to take drugs. You look at other regimes around the world where they take kids away from their families at, you know, two years old. You know, those regimes don't care uh, about paying the price. And and I think I would like to see um, a, a more open conversation within the sports world, maybe not within the wider public, about what is the price we are willing to pay to have success. Now, I was having a conversation with someone recently, uh, I'm, you know, really open. And I was saying, you know, when athletes retire, I'd like to see how we put them back together. And quite rightly, they challenged me and said, well, we shouldn't be putting them back together at the end 
And, and actually, I think where well, we agree, we shouldn't be breaking athletes. Absolutely not. But actually, we need to do, and, and I'm just talking about elite sport here, not some of the other areas I was asked to look at. But but we need to, um, as a collective, not just as individual governing bodies trying to do it, actually think about how we help and support athletes through the system. Because again, one of the things that made me really good as an athlete was being on this slightly weird knife edge of, of competing. And, and we, we don't want to lose that, but we don't want to break things along the way. So there are some really nuanced debates in this and people I think feel very strongly and it's very easily to become very quickly entrenched in, in the view. Uh, and there are very clear rights and wrongs of what is acceptable behavior. But then there are some great bits in the middle, which I think lots of governing bodies and certainly governing bodies I spoke to more recently are struggling to deal with. Now, if I go back to the original piece of work uh, that I was asked to do, uh, that uh, in, in duty care, uh, it goes back to 2015. We published in 2017. Uh, I'm not going to go through all that, but it's worth looking at the remit. It was massive and it was me. And I had a part-time member of staff from, from DCMS. So uh, I was asked to look at Olympic, Paralympic, professional sport, grassroots to elite, plus, you know, um, doping, anti-doping, gambling, uh, trans inclusion. It, it was just huge. Um, and at the time, duty of care felt it was something that people sort of knew about and thought about, but it wasn't front and centre as it is now. And I think for good and bad it's more front and centre now because of the number of governing bodies who have publicly been through uh the mill uh and there's also a number of governing bodies who've been through uh internal investigations which haven't become public um so it's not just the governing bodies that we can name uh there's there's pretty much across the system uh there are governing bodies who are now recognising they have to do things uh, in a different way. So at the time, I think the government wanted me to rank all the governing bodies. And that was impossible to do because everyone was a moment in time. And even the really good governing bodies did things sometimes that weren't so great. And, and some of the governing bodies who thought they were brilliant weren't, and some who thought they were dreadful were really good. And, and there was I, I didn't see any point in trying to, to rank them. I also didn't define duty of care very deliberately. Because as soon as I started to define it, I knew there were going to be people in the system who would challenge me on it and want to throw my whole report out because they didn't like my definition of duty of care. I also had one organisation who offered for a quarter of a million pounds to help me define it. Well, I didn't have a budget. I wasn't paid to do it. It was me. So, you know, it was that that was left um, to 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 be open because actually I think we're all bright individuals. We kind of know. 99% what we mean by duty of care. Um, I also didn't write uh, long explanations about why I came to each recommendation because uh, partly a significant, pretty much everybody who I spoke to did not want to be identified because they were scared or nervous about speaking to me and they were worried about consequences. I had people who actually didn't even want their name to be in my diary and didn't want to meet me in parliament because they were worried about coming being seen to be coming to meet me. I also had a load of people who were really open and honest through the whole system. So I said it's a moment in time. Um, and also I felt really strongly, if you know sport and, and the people who work in sport know sport, you don't need a really long explanation of why those recommendations are there. Whether it's exit interviews, induction process, it's about school sport. If you work in sport, you, you can't pretend to not understand why those recommendations were there. So the, the main recommendation, the first one I made was about an ombudsman, not the first person to do it. Kate Hoey, Colin Moynihan did it 20 years before me. Um, and uh, it was really interesting about that as well, because that opens up quite an immediate debate about what the ombudsman would do, uh, whether it was called an ombudsman. I am not wedded to the idea of it being an ombudsman. But I had to call it something because I couldn't call it. Let's have an independent body that does this, this. and that. So um, it's, it's really interesting. I've through this process, I've gone back to all my meeting notes from 2017 and beyond. And people go, yes, we need something, but not an ombudsman. It's like, no, that that's it just had to be called something. Um, I also wanted to make it really clear. I am not trying to invent a job for myself. I do not want to be uh, the ombud, whatever it is. It is not me because I'm too close to the system. I'm, I'm the wrong person to do it. I also didn't see it as a, 
a massive organization because um, what I get a lot of is well, what about the cost? So this comes back to the discussion we need to have about what is, you saw the figures that Dino put up, you know, what is the cost and what is the price worth paying? Um, it's also, you know, open for debate about, you know, what is the bar to access whatever this independent body is? Because, um, you know, th there has to be a high enough level. But the main reason I put an ombudsman in there was actually to uh, put pressure on governing bodies to better define their internal policies and processes. Now, at the same time, there was lots of work that went on the, the Sport England UK Sport um, Governance Review. And, you know, there were lots of other things happening at the time. But, but for me, it was it was really about trying to uh, look internally uh, to make sure that governing bodies were doing the absolute best they can. And the reality is, especially for some of the smaller governing bodies, their welfare people may not even be full time. They may not have huge amounts of experience in this space. Some cases are relatively simple to deal with and some are not. So, you know, the, the debate about what this body would look like um, is, is still very much on, on the table. And it's interesting, depending what review is out at the moment, depends whether people are crying out for an ombudsman and then it sort of goes away. Um, around the publication of the White Review. There were lots of people saying, yes, we need something. And it's now just ebbing away again. And I'm going to quote Primo Levi. And it's like, if not now, when? You know, on the back of the White Review, there was nothing in the White Review that surprised me or shocked me. Um, if you work in, in the stuff that I do, it's not seeing it all in one place it might have been. But actually, at what point are we going to do something different? And, and I still think we need to do. It's not revolution, it's evolution. So, you know, what an ombudsman could look like uh, or the body could look like, it could be there for advocacy and, vi advocacy and advice, um, you know, something that's slightly more informal, you know, that would be mandated by law, but would be cost free to the individual, kind of soft power, you know, athlete advocate, that's a model that the BOC, BAC is already in, in that kind of space. You could be looking at something like um, an enhanced independent, like football ombudsman with a range of soft remedies, um, you know, uh, change in behavior, uh, commit to provide a new service, reconsider decisions, which I felt haven't been taken properly. You could then go to a maladministration model, which has powers to investigate, or, or something which is just an investigatory model. So, you know, what it could look like, that there is still a massive amount of debate. So rather than just saying, no, we shouldn't have something, I think, and, and I hesitate to say there needs to be another group of people pulled together to do this, but actually within the system, there is enough expertise to pretty quickly start having some very sensible discussions about what we do, because there is a massive range of expertise out there. I think the other thing that, that we need to uh, be, um, you know, reminded of is that there are malicious complaints. They do exist. Not many of them in, in my experience, but, uh, you know, there are uh, individuals out there who will use safeguarding. I get a number of emails every year that the, the title will be safeguarding and then you look beneath and actually it's not. So I think we need to actually educate athletes, parents, everyone in the system about safeguarding. Now, other recommendations I made were around induction process for athletes. I think as part of that, we should be, and it's an appropriate age, but we should be talking to athletes within a formal environment about safeguarding, about grooming, about consent, um, so they understand these things as they go through the system. It st still doesn't make it easy for um, people to raise their heads above the parapet, but actually, we should be having um, these conversations. And I dealt with a case recently where somebody got in touch with me. Um, uh, I won't disclose the full story, but it was uh, uh, they told me uh, bullying. And we went through this long. Actually, what the athlete was being asked for was a training diary. You know, and, and so it's not going to stop. I and mean, that's a very low level thing. But but we do actually need to educate our athletes to uh, and, and everyone in the system to, to understand that. So um, I still believe there absolutely has to be something uh, in this space that uh, steps back, that is not a conflict of interest for people in the system. Now, what I've seen is there's a number of different organizations who are looking around to see whether they can do it or not. Um, 
And and I I, I get that, but it shouldn't be for an organisation to decide whether they're that body or not, whether they could change their terms and conditions. This is actually something that every single person in sport uh, needs to step up to um, and um, t- t- take more control of. Because I don't think we can just let this slip away. I, I just, I never want to n- read another white report. Am I going to? Probably. So, you know, it's, we, we've got to think about um, those those people that, that went through some horrific things, which there should never have been any need. Uh, that, that should just never have happened. That is never what sport is is meant to be. So what's changed as well in the international community this year is that uh, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, other countries are now saying we need to do something differently. Uh, and it's easy to say that when you're not six months out from an Olympics and Paralympic Games, when the medal table does matter. But actually, this is the right time to be starting having those conversations with different countries. And, and also, we need to decide whether it's just as a, as a UK or, or together with, you know, this is on the back of Commonwealth Games, but with other Commonwealth countries, other European countries, do we want to do something different? It's about accepting there will be countries that don't care about this. And, and that means we might have to think differently about how we consider the medal table. And actually, the question... I've never got to a resolution on it. How many medals is enough? You know, every sport has targets and aspirations. Uh, we have aspirations for where we want to be on the medal table. But actually, how many do we really want to win? Do we want to see brilliant sporting performance? Do we want to see the underdog coming through? Or Because actually, if as a country we decide we are just going to go for medals and be top of the medal table, that's the price we pay for doing it. Now, I don't think anybody... Uh, I, I think one or two people might want that. I don't think the vast majority of people in the sports system uh, want that. So um, the white review, horrendous. Uh, my my concern is that with each week we move away from it, that it slips down the agenda slightly. And the, the challenge with sport in terms of parliament is that it's never in the top five things that we debate in, in Parliament. It's not in the top five things consistently. It, it goes up and down within Parliament. The challenge we've got as well, I think, with the wider public is that I hear from a lot of people, well, it's a privilege to compete for GB, so you just have to, you know, no. You know, absolutely not. Um, and I think we have to, uh, you know, educate the, the public in terms of we on sport. So one of my other recommendations um, that was, was uh, in my duty care work was positions of trust. And uh, that was passed into legislation uh, this year. And um, I do want to say a quick thank you to, to Dino. Uh, we've talked about this quite a lot for um, reminding me that Bendit Like Beckham is uh, a perfect example of uh, abuse of positions of power. I can never look at that film in the same way again. I mean, it it was fairly of its time, but you know what? We we should recognise actually that was it's not this warm hearted lovely tale. It's actually something that is a much, much deeper than that. So, you know, I've been working on positions of trust for seven years. There are people who've been working on it for significantly longer than me. Um, I do want to say a huge thank you to Sarah Champion, MP, Tracy Crouch. There's many, many other organisations. Um, in some of my most challenging times working on GT Care, when if you challenge the, some, some bits of the system, the system really doesn't like it and it pushes back really hard. Um, that support was was really important for me in terms of, of what we need to get done. So some of the things on pushback and positions of trust, I was told we don't need it. There's never been in a coach in a sexual relationship with a 16 and 17 year old. You know. um, the example that I was given was what if a 20 year old um, female coach coaching on an elite program was coaching a 17 year old boy? I mean, my initial reaction is that. Right now in the system, they're not going to let a 20 year old woman coach a 17 year old boy, let alone anything else. That is not me being dismissive of the situation, because in a club situation, that may may be an issue. But but actually, we can't. And and I'm really glad that um, Robert Buckland, who is the Secretary of State for the Ministry of Justice, saw beyond some of the nonsense that was being um, pushed back and said, no, this this needs to be in. 
So he was the one that put it in the police bill. Uh, so it's called a Christmas tree bill. It was a whole, you know, massive different things. And what was interesting is the police bill was fairly hated by the public for lots of reasons because of stopping people's right to protest. But this was something that kind of slightly slipped under the radar. So uh, actually, in the end, I didn't need to push really hard to get it through into legislation at that point, because all the hard work had, had been done before. Now, it was a real balance because there are a number of peers and lords that wanted other things attached to it to dance and to um, tutoring, and which, which would have been really good. But the threat was if we uh, tried to add in anything else, we'd lose sport. And the decision I and other people made was we'll take sport and we'll try and do you know something else a, 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 along along the way as, as well. So in the end, it kind of went through under the radar. This is not about criminalising consensual relationships at all, because I think in a elite sporting context, that can be really clearly sorted through code of conduct, contracts, other things. It's about the secret relationships. It's about the green relationships. It's about people who are in perpetual relationships with, you know, young people on squads. It does not solve anything over 18. And we still have to do that. Because I think personally, that is a bigger issue within the sporting context than, um, and I've got no proof of this, it's just on the, the things that come to me. But there is more that we have to do that is incredibly hard to legislate for, but as sport and as elite sporting system, we absolutely have to, to look at that um, within the system. And I think we're going to hear from others about that as well, which is, is, is really important. Um, it's good it's through, but it's about the regs. It's about the understanding. It's about the education. Uh, and there are a number of organisations working on that. We're going to see an increase in cases. We tried to look at it, whether we could do anything retrospectively, that was not even on the table. So as much as I did want it retrospective, you know, we 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 take what we've got going forward because at least there's something on the statute books now. Uh, so now that's done, the next thing I'm working on is mandatory reporting. Uh, so I have a private member's bill. Uh, thank you to Tom Perry from Mandate Now and lots of, and to Dino and to, there's loads of other people who've helped get to this point. I'm number 25 on the list. The chances of it getting through are pretty slim. I might get to second reading. I might get one day of committee, but that is probably realistically as far as we're, we're going to get, but it is now on the table. Uh, and I think that's the next uh, piece of legislation uh, that we we need to be pushing on. And with everyone who signed in today, uh, you, you can find me on the parliamentary website. My email is greatthompson at parliament.uk. Really like to talk to anyone who would like to support, offer help to, to get this through. I mean, it's wider than sport, but you know, it's it's appalling we don't have it. And I'm doing a lot of work at the moment, looking at other jurisdictions, um, talking to people where um academics, practitioners where the where it is in um yes if we get this across the line there will be a big uplift in cases but actually that's what we want because if we're not here to protect children and to do the right thing then actually what is sport for is sport just there for sport some people argue it is but actually in the world that we live in where we argue that sport has a social value actually protecting children and young people and vulnerable adults and everyone in the system is something that we actually all have a massive duty uh, to do. So chance of it getting through, slim, but you know what, uh, unless you reform the House of Lords, I'm going to be there for a really long time and good luck reforming the House of Lords. Uh, so, you know, it, it'll just be something that I work on um, for the, the next few years. So the final thing I want to say is... Um, you know, should should we be saying to a 12 year old, this will be the most miserable experience of your life. You're not going to get selected. You're going to get injured. You're not going to earn any money. And if you're lucky, you will only be bullied, intimidated and sexually harassed. No, no, we shouldn't. Sport at its best is amazing. But actually, we should never be uh having conversations about how we put people back together you know we should be able to have a system that is fleet of foot and is designed and supported and helps people get through that sadly at the moment that conversation and not in those terms 
it's probably something we still need to be having with young people who have aspirations so they actually understand the system that going into and the choices that they make i really look forward to a day that you know we we don't have to be doing that and i do believe there are people in the system lots and lots of people in the system who want it to be better but what we can't do is keep going around in circles and keep just hoping it goes away because this is never going to go away until we all as a collective make a, a difference. So uh, I'm up for the challenge. I know loads of other people are. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to hand back to Dino and say thank you very much for your time today. That's great. Thank you so much, Tani. And I echo everything you say. Um, the next speaker up, um, very privileged he's here, actually. I know he's a busy man. It's Troy Townsend from Kick It Out, which is football's equality and inclusion uh, organisation. Um, I don't know if you watched the match yesterday, Troy, with Brazil. This is still an ongoing issue where we're looking into racial abuse and the impact on individuals. Troy's been working in this area for a long time, um, campaigning, very public voice, sometimes a public um, punching bag as well, actually, for certain views which are made. I'm really grateful you're here, Troy, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dean. I really appreciate it and a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be part of um, you know, this conversation moving forward. Um, I've got a presentation to put up because I'm not as good a speaker as Tani and uh, I need slides to help me guide myself through my, my uh, talk that I'm going to do today. Um, my name's Troy Townsend, as Dino has said, and I'm the head of uh, player engagement at the organisation Kick It Out. Now, what I wanted to do um, is just to give you an insight into not only the organisation, but where we stand in almost like the pecking order. Um, of how these incidents um, of discrimination are dealt with. A um, little bit of insight into me. I've been working in the organisation now for the past 11 years. Um, I volunteered to start with because I felt that I needed to progress my coaching out of my coaching career into um, a career of support, guidance and advice in this space. I was very privileged to be handed a full time role and alongside delivering education, which I do on a, on a mass level right across the board in the game. Um, I also, the last few years with the change of my title, which probably changes every year for some reason, um, I offer support to players or victims of discrimination in, in the beautiful game. Um, my focus area, because we, we only have a small team, but we have to obviously particularly focus on certain areas, my focus area is based on racism, uh, based on the colour of someone's skin, um, you know, their background, their faith and other uh, areas that I feel, unfortunately, are still not uh, spoken about enough and the offer of guidance and support in this space and understanding the whole process that anyone may have to go through if you want to challenge it. Um, so I am that person. Um, it's a thankless task, if you want me to be honest, and I think I might unveil some stuff as I go through my slides. Um, and yes, Dino, um, hastily this morning, I put the incident on, of Brazil into the presentation because I felt that anyone that feels that racism doesn't exist or it only lands in certain places at certain times has to understand the severity of what happened last night and the fact that the governing body of the game has yet to speak out about the incident that happened and that governing body in this incident would be FIFA. Um, so with a World Cup, um, not far away, how long is it now? It's, it's six, seven weeks, isn't it, the World Cup? Who'd believe that we ever would ever hold a World Cup in November, um, running through to nearly Christmas, by the way, um, that the closest incident of racism in this space has no word yet from its governing body, which says to me, that it's just acceptable. It's acceptable for ha to happen. It's acceptable to abuse players um, without fear of consequence. Um, and I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll go through that. So hopefully the slides are gonna help you. I just wanted to give you an insight into the organization Kick It Out, because a lot of people do still say, who are you and what do you do? And because we have representation in today's event uh, right across the board, um, it's really good to just to highlight that. So we were formed in 1997 as, sorry, I'll start again because even I've got my facts wrong. We were formed in 1993, sorry, um, by our former chairman, Lord Herman Oosley, as he was constantly contacted by black players 
um, in regards to racism. And no one was supporting them. No one was helping them. They didn't have a voice um, and they needed to, to kind of air their opinions and views to uh, in a safe space. Um, so think about all of that, first of all, to air their views in a safe space where their opinions were going to be valued, respected and also dealt with. Um, so Lord Herman Oosley, who was our chair for 27 years, formed Let's Kick Racism Out of Football just solely to deal with racism in the game. Uh, we changed our name in 1997, so that's where that year comes in, um, and to kind of tackle racism and discrimination. So we changed our name to Kick It Out with a tagline underneath it of tackling racism and discrimination. And that's when the other forms of discrimination came into play. And as the organization started to grow slightly, although in 1997, if I'm correct, there was probably only about four members of staff um, that we started to grow what we were doing. Um, and also obviously present on all aspects of discrimination um, as they were growing in the beautiful game as well. Recently, some of you may have seen, um, recently you may have seen that we've had a change of logo um, so not a change of name this time, and that recently was only about six weeks ago. Uh, it's a new, fresher brand, although I'm, I'm, that's what I'm told anyway. Um, I'm obviously of the Aberscale. We're looking at a younger market. I'm of the Aberscale, but there's the logo. It looks like a football, has the it centred right in the middle because we want everyone to focus on what the it means to them. So what this element of discrimination do you want to support us with? What impacts you? Um, and what can you challenge? I think that's uh, the kind of taglines that we're running with. Um, it's a new, fresher brand. Um, we have new kind of messaging. We have a new uh, e-learning platform on the website, and we are really trying to ramp up the conversation in this space, but also the learning in this space as well. So that's a little bit about the organization. And then I just wanted to present very quickly how the land lies. What, what is the food chain in football? Um, because again, I'll tell you this now, I get criticised quite a lot, the organisation gets criticised quite a lot, and I'm being kind when I say quite a lot, for not dealing with racism. What have you done? What are you actually doing? Um, and why have you not eliminated it from the field of play or from our stands or anything like that? And I've got to be honest, I take offence to that, um, because the incredible amount of work that I do in this space and that the organisation does, as a small charity that pits its wits um, you know, against all the elements that we're talking about here. So let's just give you a, a brief insight. The governing body is the FA. They're the overriding body. They're the body that uh, can sanction, that can uh, apply, obviously, sentences alongside, obviously, any police force that may be looking into how they deal with acts of racism as well. And that could be player on player. That could be, obviously, fan on player, um, particularly um, anything in and around the ground. Uh, comes under their kind of jurisdiction. So they are the governing body. And then there's the governing bodies of the leagues, uh, which obviously are the Premier League and the EFL. We're talking about the professional game here. Uh, many may think that the Premier League govern the whole game. Well, they don't. Um, they govern their leagues, but obviously have a tremendous amount of financial power. Um, and the EFL obviously govern the other 72 uh, teams. Uh, and then there's the union for the players in this space. Now, I work uh, massively with players um, in my role um, and the union for the players is obviously uh, the PFA, the Professional Footballers Association. If we wanted to extend to managers and coaches, the association for them is the League Managers Association. Um, and then the anti-discrimination charity is there, kick it out. Now, just to give you a flavour, and this uh, is something that's brought up to me quite a lot, where do we pull our funding from? Where do we get our money? Um, and it comes from the FA, and those arrows are pulling down where we receive our funding from. So a lot of people say, actually, can we really do the job that we're uh, that we have uh, arrived in football for when we pull our funding from the major bodies within the game? I just wanted to show you as well um, the kind of level of reports that we're getting. So we're a reporting bureau as well. So anyone that wants to report racism or discrimination in the game, they can report to us. Now you see at the bottom there that I only have figures for 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020. If you remember that 2020 to 2021 was the COVID season with no fans in stadiums, almost eliminates any reports there. 
and the reports for 2021, 22, uh, we've only just released uh, not too long ago. So it was very late into bringing this into play. But there was an increase of 42% in between the years that I've identified there uh, in regards to all forms of discrimination. And then when we look at the topic that obviously I deal with, racism, um, I've added the 2021 uh, stats there. So we've gone up from 184 reported, 282 reported in 29, 2020. Um, and then in 2021, 22, 329 uh, reports of, of racism and discrimination, an increase uh, between the first two years of 53%, and then an increase of 54% into uh, the, the season just gone. And then what we also did um, is we also did a, a YouGov poll. And why did we do a YouGov poll? Because we wanted to really understand and talk to fans um, and get their kind of contributions to um, this topic of conversation as well. Um, and our stats are at the top in black. If you look to the right there, you'll also see a 96% increase in homophobic abuse. Um, <laughs> anything near 100 is not great, is it? Um, so a 96% increase of homophobic abuse. 39% have witnessed discrimination in the past year. Remember that year was uh, pre-COVID. 71% uh, had seen racial abuse aimed at a footballer on social media. I'm not really going to do social media today because I'll take up the rest of the day and would mean that no one else will be able to present. Um, it's the murky, horrible world that um, exists for people who feel that they can be brave with an egg profile picture, let's say. Uh, and 42% have seen homophobic abuse at a football match. And the homophobic abuse, I can tell you now, is increasing week on week. Um, so we're calling for better data across the football industry. That gives us better insights and that enables better solutions in this space. We're obviously calling for tougher regulations and sanctions not just against online hate that is there, but also against the hate that continues to exist, uh, unfortunately, up and down the country. Many of them you will not be privy to. Um, I am because of my job role, but anything outside the Premier League, for some reason, doesn't get exposed in the way that it should to understand the level of discrimination that still exists um, in our game and impacts on those that are playing or those that are working in the environment and industry. And I think it's important to flag that up. And then one of the other topics that I talk about quite a lot um, is underrepresentation. Um, why do I talk about underrepresentation? I also run a program called Raise Your Game, which tries to support football to bring new, fresh individuals into the industry or provides mentoring for people that want to work in football, anything away from the playing side of the game. I can't offer contracts. If I did, I'll be the first in the queue. Um, but I can't offer contracts. So what I can do uh, is to try and fill the industry with uh, talent um, that they may not have access to. I don't believe in the term hard to reach communities. Hard to reach communities are only hard to reach if you don't want to reach out to that community. Uh, I'm just going to say that and leave that there. So, uh, Dino, can you just give me a thumbs up if this is on screen? 4,000 male professional players. Can you see that? Yes, brilliant. Okay, so we seem to be working now. Um, out of 4,000 male professional players, uh, the stats are never great in this area. I've seen 30% being floated around for about 20 years. That can't be great. Someone told me 40% the other day of Black and Asian players in the men's game, but there's no official stats. And I can't believe that either, if you want me to be totally honest. And then we talk about the massively about the lack of representation in the manager and coaching circles although the conversation has gone quiet. We introduced, a, uh, the football introduced a, a Rooney Rule type system um, a few years ago now, the mandatory code, um, which meant that there was, you know, any job that was available, that there was um, kind of like a requirement in your shortlisting process to make sure that you have a black and brown manager or coach, um, but there is a loophole in that line. Um, and that loophole is every single club's get out clause, although I don't blame the clubs for that, by the way. Um, if you're given a loophole, you're going to utilise it. Uh, and that loophole is that, you you know, this applies only when you have an open recruitment process. Um, football very rarely has an open recruitment process because if you're sacking a manager, you're in trouble, you're sacking, well, 
Let's take, for instance, the Watford situation. Watford have sacked another manager. Um, who would believe it? Um, so Rob Edwards goes and the appointment of Slaven Bilic is made, I don't know, I was out that day, but it seemed like it was made an hour later. So what kind of interview process happened there by Watford, by the way? They're not the only club, it's the most recent one to flag up. So I put up the managers that exist in our game um, and there's eight at the moment. Uh, now, some people say eight's not a bad figure because we normally bounce around between, between six, um, three, four. Jimmy, Hassel, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank has gone recently. But there's your eight managers, including Hope Powell, who obviously manages in the women's game as well. Then uh, what about representation of officials? Well, there's three, three black and Asian officials. Um, again, representing the industry, um, the transition from player to manager is quite tough. The transition of getting better representation amongst officials um, obviously needs a lot of work. Uh, two chairpersons, um, one at Burton, one at Hartlepool, and one director of football, so Les Birdland. So when anyone says to me, um, there, are issue, there aren't issues around representation, these people just need to do better. Um, I actually question it quite a lot. Um, and why do I question it? Because I talk to a lot of these people. I talk about the, I talk about, they talk to me about the difficulties they face going up the ladder. Um, they talk about how players are spoken about in their field of play, which doesn't help the transition uh, into management circles, coaching circles, because of tired stereotypes that continue to exist, even from a commentary perspective, which then also gives that perspective of, um, black people, brown people not being leaders, um, not being able to play in pivotal positions, um, not being able to support or contribute to organisations. I don't think I need to tell anyone here about uh, a di what a diverse and the impact of diverse organisations can do uh, for businesses. And remember, football clubs are businesses. Um, and with no official figures in the women's game, I'd love to have presented the comparison, particularly the way the women's game is at the moment. And maybe we will get those comparisons, you know, with significant amount of funds now going into the women's game. Uh, you know, the Sky Sports deal, the, the, the Premier League deal, significant amount of funds now going into the women's game on the back of uh, the glory of the Euros. Although again, in my field, there was a conversation about uh, representation of the England squad and what that looked like. Some say it was controversial, um, I say, let's highlight these things at the height of whatever game that we are that we are in. Um, and then there's this, and I'm hoping that the sound uh, works here because I only put in one video. This is the kind of work that I have to deal with. This is the kind of support systems I have to put in place. And I'm one individual working in this space for the organization. Um, and if I was to tell you that last season was my busiest season, bar none, in regards to supporting individuals or supporting uh, football clubs because of racism and discrimination. But again, remember what my real focus is in this area is racism due to the color of one's skin was my busiest season bar none. This season has also started, um, unfortunately, with many, many incidents that you may not be privy to um, that continue to blight our game, that continue to mean that I don't really have a spare moment um, to almost enjoy the game. My weekends are taken up with making sure that, that, that there haven't been any reports. Um, and with football at the moment being played nearly every day of the week, I'm constantly on the bounce. Um, this was an incident um, in a National League game. So let's go semi-professional football. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it um, because really and truthfully, this is the stuff that we're dealing with. So don't worry about the missed penalty. Um, we can all do that. Um, I've missed quite a few in my time. Um, did we hear that, Dino? Could you hear that? Yeah, so we heard the significant sound. Um, and the reason why I want to flag that up is because I was asked by the football club safety officer if I really thought that was monkey chanting or could it be something else, Troy? Um, I'm not going to tell you my response. Uh, it was quick, it was short, and it was sharp. Um, 
because it needed to be. Because if we're trying to convince ourselves that the noises that you heard, and hopefully you heard them, unfortunately, um, are anything but, this is the main reason why we have issues within our game. Um, this is the main reason why we do need to have a little bit of diversity in those circles, because I always think that hearing a monkey chant is quite a unique uh, sound um, that many that maybe don't see it as racism never pick up on. Um, so I <laughs> advised the club that I felt there was a young person sitting in the middle of the stadium um, who made the monkey chants um, and that they needed to, to close in the net on their investigation. As yet, four weeks later, no one's been arrested. There's no consequences at the moment. They said they'll put more stewards in the area. No one has stepped forward to say that they heard the noise, um, which happened, obviously, oh, sorry, on another two occasions, by the way. Um, and yet there's been no action. I have to go and tell that to the player. So this incident, he didn't hear it. But after a harsh tackle right in front of that stand, he heard it and highlighted it. Um, but I have to tell him that at the moment, there is no consequence to the action of that individual, whether that individual be a youngster or whatever it may be. You know, if we're not going to challenge these things, if we're not going to come to the kind of goal of, you know, trying to get these people to be educated, um, education is a must, but we need to go beyond the language of education. Um, I'm constantly in dialogue with the UK policing unit. And I question their language that they use in this space. A couple of incidents last season when they made arrests, they used the term success. One arrest out of 329 situations. I don't think we should be using the term success in this, in this environment um, or the police force using it at that stage. Success for me is if the victim is happy about the actions that were utilized against them. Um, I'm going to go very quickly into this space here because we have to discuss the women's game. Um, we discussed the game as one, let's say. So uh, a few seasons ago, the first reported incident of racial abuse in the women's game. Sophie Jones that plays for Sheffield United, Rennie Hector, who at the time played for Tottenham Hotspur. Um, Sophie uh, used the uh, monkey term little chant to Rennie Hector. Rennie didn't hear it. Massive that it was highlighted by her teammates that they heard it. Sophie received a five match ban and then basically retired from the game. Um, I was at Sheffield United recently and I was in that environment and a lot of the players spoke to me about how difficult a period it was for them as well. So actually we need to look at the impact on Rennie, absolutely what happened but also the impact of teammates who had to be interviewed, who had to give witness statements, who with Sophie gone, the legacy was left on them, by the way. Um, they weren't in a good place. Even recalling the situation three years, some years later, they still were not in a good place for some of the players that had to go through that period of time. Um, and there's a whole support system needed and required there. There is no funding for education in the women's game. No funding for education in the women's game. So we want to keep up with the men's game, although I'm just calling it football, but we're not prepared to fund education. So the fact that I was at Sheffield United for a meeting and an interview, I said I'd be happy to incorporate education for the women and girls, the girls in the RTC uh, environment, but there is no funding in the women's game for education. So when we see all that money being branded about, let's hope that they also put some aside for the, for the education element as well before these situations blow up. So Rennie Hector went public. Obviously, if you're aware of this story, she went public in, in the explanation of, of what happened. And then social media decided to target Rennie Hector as well. So not only was she the victim of racial abuse, she then became the victim of abuse because social media decided that she was lying. Uh, this image is the one that always sticks with me. Um, the image of um, a pregnant black lady and the person pointing to uh, a gorilla on the screen, on the monogram. Just think about that for a second. You've been victimized anyway. You're going through a process of why, how, me, color of your skin, etc. And this lands in a public space 
for people to, to view, um, to discuss, um, and potentially for you to see as well. Uh, yeah, that's my feeling. So I'm going to close down, but I'm going to close down with last night. Because no matter how many times I speak in this space, people say to me, ah, it, doesn't, it's, it's, it doesn't really exist, Troy, does it? You know, are you just, you know, are you trying to antagonize the system and the fact that football, you know, has a problem when it doesn't have a problem? I've never seen it. Doesn't happen at my club. Those are the kind of things that I hear quite a lot. Um, so Richarlison, in his wisdom last night, playing for Brazil against Tunisia um, in uh, Paris, so Brazil, Tunisia in Paris, that throws up a lot of complications because is it a Tunisian or is it someone that's just gone to the game um, and felt that they were going to carry their banana just in case? So what did Richarlison do wrong? What he did wrong was in the 19th minute, and I put wrong in inverted commas, he dared to score a goal. So he scored a goal in a friendly game and celebrated as you do. And you can see the image of the banana uh, that as Richardson turned around to the fans, I do have a video clip as well, but it's not as clear. So I thought I'd use the images and then the banana landed in front of Richardson. And for anyone that doesn't think that it was a banana, there it is in all its glory. I posted on social media last night because there's always this conversation around the impact of that banana. What is the significance of a banana? What, why do you get so upset? I get upset because of the connotations of racism and the history behind black people, bananas, monkeys, etc. which anyone that carries a banana to a football match, by the way, and is not gonna eat it, they know the significance of it. Uh, the belittlement, um, the dehumanization, followed by the trauma. Think of the words that I've used there amongst all of that belittlement, dehumanization, and trauma. I've had to live that experience. So I know what that, the impact of that experience is. Um, until we can get into the minds of these people, situations like that are never gonna stop. And like I said this morning, nothing from FIFA. It happened on a field of play as a team is preparing themselves for the FIFA World Cup tournament next month. Nothing from them. And by the way, we have a history in our own country. So let's not just look at it from the, the inside looking out going, they've got to do better. Uh, the famous incident of John Barnes in 1988, so a significant period of time ago, as John Bat flicks that banana off the field of play with no support, by the way, just having to deal with it. Get on with it, John. Go and play. Show them that you're better than them. I understand that in a sense, but why should we continue to do that? Why should we continue to do that? Why is there not laws that actually prevent that kind of situation from happening? And then in 2018, and this is probably the situation that riled me more than anything else. In 2018, that banana, unfortunately now, had no connotations of racism. It's a missile thrown on a football pitch. Now, I, I don't accept any, I don't condone missiles, lighters, pens, coins, cups, I don't condone it at all. But for that banana to be called a missile and have no language of racism around it as it sits in front of a Bamiyang is unbelievable. If you were to type in a Bamiyang banana, you will not see a word mentioned of racism. That's where football let the system down. That's where football let, let the players down. That's where football let, let anyone that has been discriminated in this space, it let them down. The media let them down and the law system let them down as far as I'm concerned, okay? So that's me going out saying that that was a massive one. Two weeks later, Raheem Sterling, uh, you may remember, wrote on Instagram and called out the industry. Everyone forgets this situation. And by the way, why do we still talk about racism in this space? I am finishing up now. I think I've taken a couple of minutes over. I do apologize. Uh, have a look at that cat. Lovely little thing. Just bopping along down the touchline, Champions League game. Um, I don't know how he found himself, he, she found himself in the ground, but there you go. Uh, that's the England team um, in the famous Bulgarian incident. And that's, um, why have I lost his name for a minute there? Dino, you might have to help me out there for some reason. Nicholas uh, Bentner, isn't it? Yeah, it's because he used to play for yeah. Arsenal. That's why I forgot. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas Bentner. 
Um, just exposing a little bit his Paddy Power sponsorship with his pants. Um, now, the cat cost 29,000 euros, that should be. That was the impact of the cat running down the line. 60,000 euros for the incident with Bulgaria, which also ended up with them having a partial closed stadium, but also meaning that the fans that were discriminating against the ultras, the ones that wear black, just moved to another part of the stadium when their part was closed. And then Nicholas Bentner. So the two situations of the cat and racism nearly add up to the situation of Nicholas Bentner exposing his power, power, power sponsorship. That's why there's a lack of trust and a lack of uh, appreciation um, in this game from players who have been victimized based on particular characteristics. Um, we were very close at a period of time for players walking off the field of play. And I think if the conversation has to continue, it may be that players take that responsibility again on their own hands because they're not being protected for situations. I could have highlighted a lot more. It was very short and brief. If I was to touch back into history, I mean, listen, me and Dino, uh, Dino got me involved in a situation um, that honestly got me emotional, um, led me to know that football covers up a lot of what happens in this space, doesn't speak about it openly, publicly, uh, because there's a fear that football will be judged. So certain institutions, certain um, clubs, I'm not saying anything untoward here, a fear of being labelled but then don't they have a, a duty, an obligation to protect as well? And I suppose that's where I'll leave it for now. Thank you, Dina. Great, thank you, Troy. Thank you for that. So next up, we've got uh, Myri, um, a Scottish and British international athlete, uh, co-founder of Kaniska, uh, a really impressive individual and organization which is campaigning for the improvement of um, women's sport, doing lots of really good work in a very short amount of time, actually, with different organisations. So it's my privilege to hand over to Myri. Thank you, Dino, and thank you all for being here today. Um, conversations like this are paramount to driving forward change and shaping um, the sports landscape towards a safer environment for everyone, from athletes to volunteers to parents, coaches, officials, and everyone in between. Um, I think all of the panelists here today are singing from the same hymn sheet. And to echo a little bit of what Tani said earlier before I start, this isn't about painting a dark picture of sport or suggesting that sport isn't the amazing, positive, uniting force that we all know it can be, um, but rather suggesting that we, need to highlight the real need to act and to engage in conversations to create a safe and equitable sporting culture. Um, the blame doesn't lie with individuals who work in sport because as Tani said and I'll reiterate on the whole people that we speak to do very much want change but sometimes the systems in place are preventing them from being able to. So to give a bit of context as to why I'm here today, my name is Myra McLennan and I'm an athlete first and foremost in this discussion. I'm a survivor of sexual violence in sport and I'm now the co-founder of Kaniska Advocacy. We are a volunteer run, not for profit, founded due to frustrations with a broken system and inaction from a national governing body who, in our view, were failing to prioritise the welfare and safety of all athletes of all ages in the UK. Our USP is that we are women in sport, for women in sport. Myself and co-founder Kate Seary are current athletes in athletics. We're still competing. And we work with a strong cohort of ambassadors who are a fearless group of women from a range of sports, from tennis to motorsports to football, triathlon and hockey. We work closely with these ambassadors to learn about the barriers that other sports face, acknowledging our lack of expertise outside of athletics. 
so that we can push for new and progressive policies to better protect, respect and celebrate women and girls in sport. So what policy and work areas are we focusing on? Over the past year, we've focused on female athlete health, trying to address the lack of education about how to competently and safely coach and talk to athletes around this topic, and welfare and safeguarding, stamping out sexual violence in sport. And to that end, we've published a report, which you can see the cover of there, um, we've run webinars, successfully campaigned for lifetime bans for abusive coaches in athletics, put together welfare toolkits for athletes, and we continue to work with national governing bodies on advisory panels and have regular check-ins. In the new year, we hope to launch a first point of contact service for athletes looking to provide uh, support and guidance for athletes who are nervous about or going through the reporting process. So, is sport safe? I think the short answer is no, but that's a bit defeatist. Sexual abuse and violence has gained considerable coverage uh, over the past few years. There is now a subcategory in The Guardian titled Sexual Abuse in Sport, with around 50 articles from the past two years over 20 of which are from this year alone. There are stories from swimming, speed skating, athletics, football, gymnastics, to name a few. The stories are piling up and it is difficult to grasp the scale of the problem without feeling overwhelmed. I think it's important to highlight that athletes don't stop being vulnerable to violence, abuse and exploitation once they surpass the age of 18, especially in power imbalanced relationships. And in my opinion, sport fails to recognize that. Abuse in sport, and when I say abuse, I mean physical, sexual, emotional, and otherwise is endemic. And this has to change. Historically, the sports sector has been largely autonomous, leading to a reluctance from the UK government to intervene in sport. Not only that, but sport is a devolved matter. So there is no guaranteed consistency between the Scottish government, the Welsh Senate, the Northern Irish Assembly and the UK government. These factors together have led to a legacy of traditionalism and resistance to change. As a result, measures to safeguard children in sport are still relatively recent additions to the British sports policy agenda. We can track back through the past 20 to 30 years or more to understand why sport operates in the way that it does. And there are many reasons for this as I and others today have alluded to, from devolved governments to lottery funding and self-governance, all leading to a fragmented system with very little data sharing, no consistency and too many loopholes. In order to move forwards, as Tani also alluded to, we have to openly acknowledge that the very nature of sport creates unique risks when it comes to the safety and welfare of its participants. So why is sport not safe? In addition to what I've already covered and everybody else has already covered, sport is inherently physical. So contact between athletes and coaches is normal. This is often used as a pretext for violence uh, of a sexual nature, emotional nature and physical nature. We know that many people with lived experience have reported that the sexual violence they've experienced followed or happened during legitimate physical contact, such as during sports massages, massages, physiotherapy and medical examinations. It's also really important to acknowledge that the focus on almost exclusively creating protective policies for children defined as under 18 years of age draws attention and resources away from those who are over that age boundary, including many people with disabilities and especially adult women in sport. While new and crucial policies like the positions of trust le legislation that Tani was discussing earlier which prohibits relationships between coaches and athletes under 18, 
are really welcome and incredibly important, they do fail to protect young adults. But the sad thing is that if this legislation had ever been suggested to cover all ages, it would never have come into law. In recent years, there have been num numerous alleged and proven instances of coaches coercing athletes over the age of 18 into sexual relationships or of using their power and position to cover up physical, sexual or emotional and psychological violence. Athletes and sports people are often seen as commodities, as a spectacle, a performance, and we forget that there are human beings behind those performances. One factor that I haven't really spoken to is money. The issue is that robust and effective safeguarding and welfare cost money. We need full-time paid and fully trained welfare officers in every sport. And small national governing bodies simply do not have the funds to operate adequate safeguarding and welfare programs. Welfare and safeguarding are far too often seen as tick box exercises and when sexual abuse cases and institutional duty of care failings are reported and investigated by national governing bodies, ultimately marking their own homework, the lack of internal expertise and sometimes the recognition of conflict of interest can lead to expensive external reviews like we've seen this year with the White Review in Gymnastics and before that, the Quinlan Review in Athletics. Safeguarding and welfare need to be funded and prioritised. And unless there is ring-fenced funding for these processes within national governing bodies, we are going to keep failing athletes. So <clears throat> how do the athletes feel about all of this? Well, unfortunately, there is a terrifying lack of trust between the participants in sport and the systems designed to protect them. Part of that is due to a wider cultural issue uh, caused by inaction in tackling violence against women and girls across the country. And part of that is being that sport is underfunded and staff are overworked. A lack of faith in the current system can mean that people with lived experience do not believe that the outcome of their report will be worth the trauma of reporting. People with lived experience know that their complaints are unlikely to be dealt with by an independent body and instead are reliant on their national governing body. There are several anomalies that we believe are unique to sport. Um, that create a particularly high risk environment for participants. Firstly, the inherent power imbalance between coaches and athletes. The future careers and successes of athletes lie heavily in the hands of coaches and management. Traditionally, across many sports, a high value has also been placed on athlete compliance completing training programs, acting on feedback, following tactics, and even eating in a certain way, often without question. And we know that women and girls are usually less likely to push back against excessive or abusive regimes. Secondly, a success at all costs mentality within many sports can mean that the extreme and abusive coaching techniques can be tolerated or even praised as inspirational or groundbreaking if they deliver medals. Blind eyes can often be turned in the face of inappropriate behavior or rumors about coaches or management if their work is viewed as pivotal to the success of these athletes. Parents have also been known to turn a blind eye. Sporting success is so often associated with pain and discomfort as athletes push their bodies to the limits. And this culture can lead athletes to being forced to cope with actual abuse or inappropriate behavior and simply tough it out. Finally, <clears throat> there remains a culture within some sports which accommodates verbal, physical, and even sexually abusive behavior disguised as banter, initiations, or team bonding. This culture can speak to the high frequency of peer abuse and harassment while uh, there are still cases of coach to athlete abuse that come under this guise. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
Um, whilst the professionalization of many sports has meant that cases that fall under this guise have reduced, sport that exists within amateur grassroots school and universities um, still have high incidence of this type of abusive behavior that are seen as part of the culture. It is true that many cases are regularly reported, but many more instances go unreported or are just rumored um, as they're seen as part of a normal sporting experience. At Kaniska, we've even seen cases where coaches have been known to brush off accusations of inappropriate behavior, saying, I'm not PC, just accept it. <clears throat> The current safeguarding and reporting systems established within many sports mean that we have three identifiable reasons that can mean that athletes might be less likely to report. In our most recent report, Stamping Out Sexual Violence in Sport, we discussed how these systems quite often put the onus on individuals to speak up. <clears throat> and these are three of the key reasons that we identified that might explain why athletes are less likely to speak up. One being that there are figures in sport, including coaches, that are perceived as being untouchable. They're hero worship, if you like. This is often because of their achievements, positions of authority or reputation for producing successful athletes and their connections within the sport. Two, sports communities are often tight-knit social circles, meaning that people with lived experience fear disrupting that social circle hierarchy and being ostracized or left out and not being believed, uh, or their report not even being acted on due to the community sort of closing ranks to protect the per perpetrator. If you can imagine whether if you lived on a small island in Scotland or uh, off the coast of England <clears throat> or even in a small village and the welfare officer could be a family friend or the perpetrator might be a, an acquaintance's family member, it's very possible that you'll feel less confident reporting. And the third reason, uh, often athletes fear speaking out at the risk of losing performance opportunities, funding and sponsorship, which all rely heavily on coaches and management and national governing bodies themselves. British gymnasts have referred to the fear of rocking the boat and the need to remain silent to avoid deselection. Athletes essentially are afraid to speak out because of the consequences it may have on their careers. And Tani also touched on that earlier. I'm essentially just repeating everything Tani said because everything she said was accurate. Um, so after a morning of this panel talking to the risks and dangers in sport from varying angles of experience and involvement, what do I and by extension Kaniska believe is the answer or the answers? Well, for starters, these are the recommendations which echo much of what was in Tani's 2017 duty of care report, which we believe would go some way to improving the safety of all athletes of any age and at all levels of sport. There is no one silver bullet policy or system change that will wipe out abuse in sport. You can't just slap a policy on top of a problem and expect change to happen. It has to be seen holistically and we have to consider a multifaceted approach. Yes, there is need for cultural and educational change and at Kaniska, we are trying to fight every day to tackle that. But there is a very real need to change the way that we are dealing with perpetrators of abuse. For now though, <clears throat> please follow us, share our work and donate where you feel able. I want to thank all of you for being here today and for taking this first step to being part of this discussion and for Dino for bringing us all together. Uh, Dino has been pretty integral to Kaniska setting up, uh, to gaining credibility and to opening doors like this for conversations like today. Um, and yeah, hopefully you've found some of this informative, if not uh, interesting. So thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Mari. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, next up, 
we have Eloise Jutiski, um, a former gymnast who um, sadly suffered abuse within the sport. She's going to be discussing her experience with British Gymnastics throughout the process of the investigation, the findings which were made, and also give us an update actually what has changed or what should change. Um, I'll just pass over to you, uh, Eloise. My name is Eloise Jatiski, um, and I'm 19 years old, and I'm a former elite acrobatic gymnast. And earlier this year, I became the first person um, to win a legal case against British Gymnastics as part of Hausfeld's group legal action. And the case against British Gymnastics is really for um, abuse and negligence. And so as a result of my case being successful, um, British Gymnastics, the governing body, accepted 100% liability for everything that happened, you know, accepted responsibility. Um, I received compensation for the injuries suffered as a result of the abuse. And most importantly, um, I received a full and thorough apology uh, for everything that happened from British Gymnastics' CEO, Sarah Powell. Um, Yet, despite all of this, to this date, my coach is currently working in a British Gymnastics accredited club. And so in this presentation, you know, in addition to talking about my legal case, what I really aim to highlight and draw your attention to um, is a serious safeguarding loophole, which still exists and allows coaches like mine to continue working despite having been identified as you know, abusive coaches through a legal case. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, I started gymnastics when I was six. Um, I was constantly doing cartwheels and handstands around the house um, and I was quite unusually flexible. So that's when my parents decided to put me into gymnastics club. And I think it's, you know, it's really important to note that sport is intrinsic to a child's development. You know, it can equip you with invaluable lifelong skills, um, just to name a few, perseverance, resilience. I think it has the potential to build your confidence massively. Um, and especially when you move on to the elite side of sport, I think it can give you great time management skills, um, discipline. Um, and obviously these are applicable to all aspects of life. Um, however, as I moved into the elite phase of gymnastics and the elite side of the sport, um, I witnessed and experienced myself, um, you know, it was ritual, what I now recognize as emotional and psychological abuse, and it was ritual humiliation, you know, verbal harassment, um, bullying, and body shaming perpetrated by coaches, and here we're talking about children. So when I experienced this and I was put on a diet when I was training 25 hours a week, age 12, I was put on a diet of around just over a thousand calories a day. And I witnessed this happening to children younger than me, you know, age nine and 10. Um, and so just to give you a bit of context as well, my coach was suspended uh, before this was before coaching me uh, my coach was suspended by British Gymnastics and he um, was meant to undergo a three-year ban suspension from the sport um, for various reasons he did he was allowed to come back prematurely by British Gymnastics and that's when he came back to my gymnastics club and coached me um, and so what initiated the legal case was actually the to begin with uh, the release of the documentary film athlete a on netflix and this documentary it detailed the shocking and awful sexual abuse that hundreds of u.s gymnasts were subject to um, by their team doctor larry nassar but the thing about this documentary was that it went deeper than just exposing this abuse and it detailed the extremely toxic culture from the top down, um, which not only enabled the emotional abuse and gaslighting, but it totally normalized it. And so you have this environment where you have gymnasts, you know, children, um, they're silenced, they're not believed, they don't feel as though they have a voice to speak up. And that then in turn allows predators like NASA to come and take complete advantage of this culture. And it was this really um, toxic culture and emotional abuse side of things that many gymnasts and physical abuse um, that many gymnasts in this country really related to. 
Um, and after the release of this film, that's when people started speaking out about it. And this consequently led to the commission of the White Review, um, which we have obviously discussed earlier, and the initiation of the legal case against British gymnastics. And, you know, what I think is really important to know is that I'm not a unique case. Um, you know, this is not a bad apple problem. And I think what Anne White really accurately concluded um, in her into her in, in her report, um, which was published this year, her report into abuse in gymnastics, was that this is systemic. And this was allowed to happen because of a refusal to accept responsibility amongst the top layers of the governing body. And one of the quotes from her report, which really, which really stuck with me. Um, was when she said, when I pressed various board members about what the board could and should have known of the extent of cultural malaise and the prevalence of emotional and physical abuse in the sport, I was met more than once with the rhetorical response, we only know what we know. This is no answer. Gaps in boardroom knowledge start and end with the board and with the CEO. And I think that quote can really um, speak for itself. Um, so moving on to winning the legal case. So I found out um, early this year that I had won my legal case. Um, BG's insurers lawyers accepted 100% liability for the abuse. You know, if they accepted it happened, it was settled outside of court. Um, however, on the same weekend as receiving this letter, receiving this result that they'd accepted it all, I found out that my coach had been given GB accreditation by British Gymnastics to represent GB as a coach at the World Championships, which, were hap which was happening that weekend. So, and just for a bit of context, um, FIG, the Federation of International Gymnastics, state that in their document for how governing bodies should award coaches with um, accreditation, they state that the accreditation identifies individuals in good standing from FIG affiliated federations participating in the event. So, you know, on one hand, you've got British Gymnastics admitting full liability for an abusive coach. They've accepted that everything that's happened. They had enough of my evidence. They didn't need to contest any of the allegations and they're taking responsibility. And on the other hand, they are effectively saying that this is a coach who is in good standing to continue working and coaching um, at a major international event. And, you know, I think it was just at that point when I just lost all faith and trust in the system. Um, and that's when I ended up contacting Natalie Perks from the BBC. And I gave an interview with her, um, which aired on the 10 p.m. news, sort of hoping that this would shame them into action. Um, and to some extent it did. So this interview coincided with the settlement of my legal case. And I think it was a combination of both, which led to my coach. Um, he gave up his British Gymnastics membership and he was banned from entering the premises of my gymnastics club. Um, and around the same time, I received an apology, this the apology that I received from um, BG CEO. But I think, you know, the overarching question is here, you know, is it really the media's job to force a governing body into action? Um, but moving on to the apology. So at first, um, I was really pleased to receive this. Um, and I, you know, I thought it was really genuine and thorough. And I, you can see on my slide, um, I've quoted some of it. Um, you know, and she says how it's a matter of profound regret for British gymnastics that this occurred. And, you know, she acknowledges that the behavior of my coach was short of British gymnastics standards. So having spent a year and a half of my life, my adolescent life being involved in this legal case, you know, it being successful, and then to receive this apology, I honestly believe that this would be the end of it and I would, you know, just be able to get on with my life. Um, but it was soon after this, which I found out that um, I was being contacted for, by gymnasts from King Evans Gymnastics Club in Bristol. And they were telling me that my coach was now working with them. Um, and he had basically from being banned from my previous club, he had now landed himself with a new job at a new gymnastics club. And the reason being is because there is a significant safeguarding loophole. Um, and you can see I've quoted some of Sarah Powell's email where she explains this loophole to me. And she says, unlike coaches, choreographers, and other roles not directly concerned with delivering gymnastics do not require a British gymnastics membership. So this effectively means if you want to go and coach, if you want to be a physio, if you want to help with 
you know, I don't know, dance or routines, you do not need a British Gymnastics membership in order to go and work with children, even if you have been, been identified as an abusive coach. Um, you know, and I was just utterly stunned by this. And so my coach is now working at this gymnastics club um, in the capacity of a choreographer. But, you know, I've been a gymnast. Choreography is so much more than just teaching a routine. You know, you're working with you're working with children. Um, and I was just yeah, I was just utterly shocked by this. And, you know, I'm delighted to have won my legal case. And it was so important for me and you know, receiving that personal redress. But I've always been motivated by ensuring that, you know, what happened to me and numerous others is not repeated with the next generation of gymnasts. You know, it's just so depressing to hear from current gymnasts at this club that he's working there and there's no evidence that his behavior has changed. Um, and then on top of this, so this club hosted this summer an international training camp where they invited all different clubs um, to come and work there. And so my my co my former coach was listed on this flyer as an um, attendee. He was there in the capacity of a choreographer. Um, but once the flyer had been you know, released by the club, there were subsequent representations regarding his attendance, because obviously it's quite controversial to be publicizing that you're um, choosing to employ an abusive coach to come and coach children. Um, and so in response, the club actually removed his name from the flyer, but he still turned up. He was still there coaching, you know, but in secret. So they're effectively misleading um, their attendees, gymnasts parents cannot make an informed decision about whether they want to go and be coached by an abusive coach um, and so I think you know I think it's just this example which really speaks volumes of this endemic culture which is just still so prevalent and you have to wonder why a club would want to make such an effort to an employ an abusive coach who has twice now been identified as abusive you know, are they putting welfare and safety of their athletes first or are they continuing to prioritize medals and winning? Um, and I think that this leads me on to the changes that I believe are needed um, in order to reform this. And the first one is grassroots education and re-education of coaches to halt the cycle. Um, and I think that, you know, this is absolutely paramount because you've got this cycle of abuse with coaches, having been coached by abusive coaches and then going on to repeat the same pattern of behavior. And I'm not talking here about all coaches. You know, I know that there are many who make a conscious effort not to continue this pattern because they understand the detrimental impacts that it has on athletes and children. Um, but you also must ask yourself why this has been going on for so long. You know, Hausfeld, so the law firm that represented me, they have, they still have 37 clients. It's an ongoing case, but they have clients who were experiencing the same thing in the 1980s that I was in 2018. You know, and you have to, you have to ask yourself why the same thing is happening nearly 40 years later. Um, and I think the next point is so effective monitoring of clubs by British Gymnastics to ensure that policies are implemented. Um, you know, I know for a fact that my club had British Gymnastics as policies on their website and essentially it's just a box ticking exercise of paying lip service to them because when I was um, being coached by my coach, um, you know, there he went against every single policy on a, every single recommendation on a particular policy. And so, you know, governing bodies actually need to take a more proactive stance in ensuring that policies are being followed by clubs and they must sanction them if they're not. And that leads me on to the next um, change that I believe is needed. So Ofsted style inspections like we've got in schools. And this can be another um, mechanism to ensure that policies are being implemented because, you know, if you have inspectors going into clubs, they're you know, observing the, the culture um, of the club and they can anonymously speak to parents and gymnasts and, you know, subsequently um, publish a report and give the club a grade. This, of course, is likely to incentivize clubs to actually follow, you know, these policies because, of course, they're going to want more athletes joining their clubs. Um, so, yeah, and I think obviously the final one that has been um, Tani discussed this before is mandatory reporting. And of course, I agree that this is um, as well vital um, in order to reform the sport. Um, and so just moving on to some final thoughts. Um, 
you know, I understand that this presentation may have felt quite negative at times and full of criticism for the governing body for what is continuing to happen. Um, but since winning my legal case, I feel that myself and numerous others have effectively been fulfilling a safeguarding role by drawing attention to these loopholes. Um, and, you know, I'm going to university next week and I'm starting a new phase in my life and I don't want to have to act as the conscience of British gymnastics. Um, and my hope is that people can learn from past mistakes and past failings. You know, we can't change what's happened in the past, what's done is done, but we can learn from this. And, you know, I think people need to learn and take tangible actions, which will have a lasting impact on the sport. And despite everything, you know, I still love the sport of gymnastics. In a couple of months time, I'll be in Liverpool watching the world championships. Um, and so I'm just really hoping that webinars like this can draw attention to the problems that sport is facing to ensure that it is safer for future generations. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Lee Day for inviting me um, to speak at this conference and giving me uh, this platform to share my experiences. So, thank you. Thanks, Eloise. Really appreciate that. Thank you. The next session of the webinar is a, a Q&A session. So thank you for everyone who's been sending in messages throughout the, the day. Um, just to start off with, um, there's a question for Tani. Um, obviously, the last duty of care review was five years ago. Um, do we need to do another one? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, it, maybe, maybe not to the extent that I did, but I think there's a, a, a need for an independent um, check. And it's really difficult because governing bodies are doing it. And I'm chair of Sport Wales now. Uh, and with that, I sit on UK Sport. And, you know, there's lots of checks. There's a health check. Um, there's new work by UK Sport uh, in terms of looking at governance. and but, but I do think an independent sort of outside check is, is helpful, the, the level and extent and how much we pay for it um, and, and what it uncovers is, is always a challenge. You know, White Review, I've heard wildly significant um, amounts about how much it costs, and it's a really important piece of work. But, but also, you know, we, we don't necessarily have, have the time to do it. So it comes back to the ombudsman. You know, that, that's it, it's an ongoing evolution. So, so yes, but maybe not to the depth that, that I did it. And just following on from that, there's just two points. One is, um, how do you feel that the fact that athletes have to come to you? How do you feel that there's not a kind of independent helpline organisation? Because obviously this is not your, it's not your job, is it? But they feel a need to come. How do you feel about that? uh no i'm not trained for it either uh it. it's hard because actually um you know uh, i found i mean this is five years ago you know a lot of athletes didn't know about the bac some governing bodies didn't want their athletes to know and then there's trust you know i have no it's awful it, it's it, it's it's and it's it's not the way it should work there there should be places for athletes to go but people come to me talking about careers and it's really emotive you know when you're especially you know, come into the end of your career. I had an athlete ring me recently who couldn't talk to their partner, their parents, their coach, their PD. And I was the one that they didn't have to explain elite sport to because it is a weird world. So yeah, no, it's not. I mean, but, but it, it, is, but it is. Yeah. It's, it's not right. It's yeah. it, because also I'm, I don't necessarily have the skills. Um, psychologically, it's really hard. Yeah. Really hard. And just one final question before I ask some of the others and I'll come back to you. You mentioned in your talk, this is a question for me actually, about the cost per medal. Um, is there any data, do you know, I don't know any, but in relation to a cost per survivor, have you seen that? No. no. Okay. We should, we should. We should do. Yeah, I'm just gonna briefly say, if you add up the cost of all the reviews, mm -hmm. you know, cycling, canoeing, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to pick, but you know, and then the ones that aren't public, plus white, a lot of money. Yeah, it is, yeah, no, that's fair. Um, for Troy, the next set of questions. Um, obviously, kick it out is in football, Troy. Um, football is one sport. Um, I know it's a nation sport, and I understand that has the, you know, the greatest kind of awareness. But the question for you is, do we need a Troy Townsend? Do we need a kick it out in other sports? Um, 
I don't want anyone to ever be like me. So maybe not a choice, <laughs> to have them, but maybe someone. <laughs> um, uh, listen, uh, to, not to not to make light of it. Absolutely, absolutely. I think since twenty twenty, um, I've been contacted by more sports than ever before. So in my previous uh, nine years at the organisation, you know, after the, the the murder of George Floyd, there was an invested mm-hmm. interest to, to for everyone to look at each other, wasn't there? Um, and a number of sports did that. To be totally honest, and you know. We know what's going on in cricket because it's public and it's highlighted and we're trying to provide support to cricket in various areas, as have a number of other organisations as well, as cricket has reached out to support. um, You know, I'm not sure cricket would have reached out for support if those situations hadn't come to light. But listen, it is what it is. Um, Recently by basketball um, and potentially in tennis as well. So I do believe that actually there are functions that uh, for us that will, will cross other sports. But as a small charity, it's very hard for us to take on that extra responsibility to support those other support, uh, sports in the manner that we do. But in regards to an organisation that could be created like ours and, and maybe we could lend support, um, then absolutely. I think it's, it's vital um, because... We only know what we know. So some people that have been brave enough to come out and share the, those experiences, highlighted, you know, those experiences being highlighted is what we know. What about the unknown? What about what we don't know? What about people who are still, you know, too frightened to even talk about some of the experience that they have gone through and maybe only are empowered when they're older and out of the industry, you know, or that they're in. So yes to both of those questions. Um, I'd be happy to meet and have a Troy Towns and I'd definitely support the, the development of other organisations in this space that could deal with the situations that are, that are you know, existing and growing in other sports as well. And just following on from that, obviously you do lots of education. Do you have any kind of data to show the success rates? Because education is the ideal position, isn't it? In that you prevent abuse. Or for those abusers, you educate them to stop being, uh, you know, racially abusive and other discrimination. Is there a good success rate? I know it's difficult to say, but but is there? I don't think you can judge it like that, Dino. Um, I understand your question, but it's hard to judge it in that way. So I educate, just to give you some background, I, I go into clubs, mandatory for Premier League clubs, not for Football League clubs, but I go in and provide education from the under nines all the way through to under 21s as they are now, uh, staff and parents um, in different sessions. And I'll probably say to you that the, listen, while I enjoy going in because I'm not talking at any individual, I'm, I'm talking with, so I'm listening to experiences, I'm, I'm vi- advising, I'm presenting the scenarios as they currently exist in our sport um, and as they do in other sports. But look, last season, I, I delivered to over 1,500 people you know, that has to have an influence somewhere along the line. That that, that has to um, kind of acknowledge the fact that we also want to empower. So I am infused by the young players at this stage who have come out of their comfort zone and spoken about their experiences. You know, your Rian Brewsters, your Raheem Sterlings, your Marcus Rashfords. You know, players weren't doing that while they were playing before. Players were waiting until their careers had finished before they'd even contemplate talking in this space um so you know those guys have have been part of my sessions in the past and i can only hope that it's the influence and the knowledge and the understanding that they receive and the empowerment that enables them at a young age to 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 talk their real truth you know Mm -hmm. rian brewster done it at 17 years of age so the Mm -hmm. success of rian brewster speaking if we using that term success is that every time he has been racially abused, and he was four times in 18 months across the English game and Europe, by the way, because Liverpool represented uh, England in the Youth Champions League, so the same version of the Champions League. And they prepped their players to travel to Russia. And so I went in, delivered a session to them and their staff. So if this can become under success, to prepare them for the eventuality that the potential that they may be racially abused. Now, I'm not happy about this, but the racial abuse happened. 
But yeah. what I am happy about is the process and the steps that the players and the club took. Mm. One, the club to protect their players. Two, to speak up. Stephen Gerrard was the manager to know the right processes in challenging the officials on the day mm. and then going through the process of supporting the victims. So two players that were racially abused and then to work with UEFA so that it, it doesn't happen to any young person in that competition again. Yeah. You know, but the unfortunate thing in my game is that football's not very good at delivering stats. It's not very good in, in showing the nature of what exists and the growth that it's probably had in this space, but the growth that it needs to continue to have. And I yeah. think that's the only thing that I'd label against our game is that any stat that enables us to, to put more work in, more time in, you know, get more funding for, has to be a positive, even from the outset, if it doesn't look great. Yeah. And a personal question for me, you, for, for me, Troy. Um, you talk about disclosure. It's really important that we make sure athletes, footballers and others feel able to disclose. Obviously, speaking is one aspect. The listening and acting is another. My previous experience, and you know this, yeah. those organisations, we're talking about the Football Association in this instance. Do you think it's fit for purpose? So when black players raise abuse, when they go through a disciplinary process, um, John Yems is currently going through it for alleged racial abuse at Crawley. Um, do you think the FA, the Football Association, is fit for purpose in relation to allegations of racial abuse and discrimination? Is there any journalists on there today? <laughs> um, I hope we are not quoted around that. Listen, I think football has to do so much better. You use the term alleged there and understand why you use it. And yeah. I know why you use it. But alleged has a massive impact on the victims in that case against Johnny Yems, um, who know the experiences that that manager at the time put mm. them through. Now, the processes that Johnny Yems had, I know a week after that mutual agreement, as it was put to leave Crawley Town Football Club, Johnny Yems was touting himself for positions in uh, coaching and managing positions in League Two. I mean, someone that's under investigation for acts of discrimination to be able to just tout themselves for another job while that investigation is un ongoing says to me that he's confident they will get off of it. And so this is at a stage where, listen, you say fit for purpose. We're doing a piece of work with the FA now, so I suppose I have to mind what I say here, that hopefully highlights all of that in the grassroots environment, that hopefully will produce stats and figures that we haven't done in the past Next month, by the way, so look out for this next month at the moment in that space, the unfortunate nature of the abuse that exists and what we can do about it. Now, all I hope is they don't play lip service to the conversation because I have seen some of the stats and they're not great at all, as you'd expect. I've also seen some of the respondents and for some reason, I think we know the reason, the, the percentage of black and Asian contributions and women is very low, very low. So how can we target a response when actually we haven't got those communities contributing to the data? Yeah. So that's where I talk about that hard to reach scenario. Are they hard to reach or do we not effectively know how to connect with them or have the processes that we have in place um, almost discriminated against them second time around? So I think there's a lot of work to do in this space for football. There's positive work going on, but and people say to me, oh, you're always negative. I'm sorry, I hear the horror stories. I am sitting down with people who have been victimised, who don't know where to turn, and also think that football has failed them. And so that's where I lean my support to more than the generalisation. But the hearing process could be better. The I think if the FA need to change their wording and update it in regards to sanctions around discrimination and i think they're looking at it i don't think the uh, the language and terminology used in regards to hearing and the protection of people that have been victimized is good enough so needs to be re i think everything just needs to be updated yeah. to reflect where we are in this space and i think if we if, if that gets updated we actually have different and better outcomes for people that have been victimized in this space thank you troy um, the next set of questions are for Myrick. Um, 
I'll start off with my personal one before I go through the questions from the attendees. What do you think of the fact that you need to exist in, in itself as, as Kaniska, in that we're talking about women's sport, uh, female athletes, and that there's such a need to make sure you have an equal grounding, an equal level of safeguarding and making sure that we appreciate the differences and support those as well? Um, what do I think about the fact that we need to exist? Um, I don't think it's great. Um, I'd rather not have to be doing what we do, I suppose. In many ways, it's really, um, it can be rewarding, but it's mostly incredibly frustrating. Um, I didn't really cover that, cover it that much when I was doing the presentation, but Kaniska kind of happened as an accident. Um, my so my previous coach was issued with a five-year temporary ban um after four complaints from female athletes and two complaints from male coaches about inappropriate sexual behavior um one of which was an underage athlete and um i remember at the time somebody asked me oh how do you feel about the temporary ban and it wasn't until then that i realized the relief that something had happened because I was so terrified that nothing would happen was actually misplaced. And I should be angry that there was a five-year ban because what happens in that five years, that means that this person can come back and coach women and underage athletes again. Um, so that was when myself, Kate Siri, who's now the co-founder of Kaniska Advocacy, decided to launch an open letter to UK athletics and demand lifetime bans. Um, and I think it, we kind of stumbled into it because of both of our lived experience of kind of not feeling safe in sport that we realized that, well, if this problem exists in athletics, it exists in every sport. And actually the problem is much, much greater. Um, we, we picked at a spot and it's become this volcano that actually is a much greater issue than I could have ever envisaged. Um, and now, similar to Tani, we have athletes reaching out to us all the time who are too afraid to go to their national governing body and who won't just want to speak to somebody who's been through the same thing. Welfare officers are often, and this is no fault of the welfare officers, but they're often much older. Uh, they can, they're often men. And when you're like 16 or you're 17, 18, early twenties, that's a really terrifying prospect to have to go and speak to a stranger about this thing that you're just getting to grips with yourself because often as we all know, a lot of the abuse athletes undergo is part of grooming. So it's taken a process of realization for athletes to even kind of wrestle with the reality of what's happened to them. Um, and then having to kind of, yeah, go through that reporting process where this truth you've just become comfortable with is put under a spotlight and questioned and torn apart. Um, so yeah, we're sort of at the moment, until we develop a proper system ourselves, um, unofficially trying to guide athletes through that reporting process and uh, recognizing that, yeah, we're sort of just trying to be a friend, uh, giving advice um, to other athletes. And so, yeah, how do I feel? Not great, um, but, but trying. Trying, fine. So some of the questions have been, obviously, you know, we know you're Scottish, which is noted. And the problem with British athletics is that there are different governing bodies. So you have Wales, Scotland, Ireland and England, and then you've got the national governing body. And there are different rules, different processes, different investigations. How have you found that working with these different organisations and trying to work with an organisation, but on different fronts? How have you found that? It's really frustrating and sometimes confusing because kind of as we were trying, I think all trying to allude to throughout this, this morning, there's, the, the, the system is so fragmented. So as you've just said, just within athletics, to give that as an example, you've got Scottish, Welsh, Northern Ireland, uh, England athletics, then you've got UK athletics that manages safeguarding and kind of the business side of things. And then you've also got British athletics, which, which deals with performance. And that's mm -hmm. one sport. Yeah. And it's, it's like that in every sport. So when you're trying to get change, you can, there's no kind of top to go to. There's not like a kind of all seeing, all deciding kind of independent 
ombudsman, as Tani was kind of advocating for, and, and we do too, you have to go to each individual national governing body. And if you are focusing on the UK as a whole, that means going to four national governing bodies for each sport. And when you consider how many sports there are, that's an exhausting process to try and convince everybody that change needs to happen. And sometimes they're already convinced you're not actually selling an ideology, but they don't have the resources, staff, time, money to do so. Um, and that's another one of the main, like huge issues in sport that there's just because sport is not um, it's not like a kind of athlete is not necessarily a protected career path and neither is coach a protected title. The whole system is kind of like living in the wild west and trying to yeah herd people into a coherent uh, overarching system. Thank you. A couple of questions for Eloise. Um, one of the questions which has come up a couple of times is about the power of an apology. Um, and I would be interested to hear what your response is to that. So before and after you found out about your coach, what was the power of that apology to you? Um, I think before, you know, as part of the settlement, an apology was always something that I'd wanted. You know, it's an acknowledgement of what happened and just, you know, accepting that it's happened, apologizing for it. And I think, when someone apologizes for something that's happened and expresses profound regret, you expect then actions to be taken in order to prevent that from happening again. And so I think with an apology, that's what I kind of assumed and expected would come of it. Um, but now I kind of, you know, I just think what's what was really the point in that, um, you know, if the coach is allowed to continue working with children, you've apologized for the action. So you know, it, it feels slightly meaningless um, well, after seeing, yeah, the, the yeah, follow up from that. That's fair. Um, and you said that your interest and your passion for gymnastics is, is still alive, which is good. Um, but a secondary question to that is that if you had siblings or your friends or children or anyone else was going to take part in gymnastics, would you feel comfortable? Do you think the safe is the sport is safe or is it safer post white post your case or not um my honest answer is is that i wouldn't really feel comfortable um particularly if they were you know taking part in elite gymnastics um because i just think that there is still so much to be done and it's really i'm not seeing the pot, like the recommendations from the white review being implemented um, and, you know, I still talk to people from the gym world and get an understanding of what's continuing to happen. And so, you know, I think until there are tangible actions taken and you can see a difference and you can see the culture within clubs changing, I really, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable with people. And do you believe in change? Do you still believe? Yeah, I think I do. I think, you know, I try and stay optimistic. Um, I think, you know, there's definitely potential to change. I think that the new, particularly from my experiences, I think the new leadership at British Gymnastics, I don't think, you know, I, I genuinely think that they came into this role hoping to make a difference and hoping to change because obviously there was a lot of criticism for the old um, leadership. And, you know, I don't think you take the job unless you're, you want to do something. So I think that, you know, things can be done, but yeah, I think just more, more. Cool. Needs to be done. Um, I think Tani, you got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to butt in. I was just going to say Eloise's comment about allow wanting children to do it. When I did my piece of work back in 2017, significant number of athletes across pretty much every sport said the same thing, yeah. that they they want their child to be fit and healthy and be physically active and they would love them to play sport, but not necessarily go into their sport. So that's that's a thing that the whole system has to tackle, actually. It's it's not just a, a one-off. And Seeing as I've got you, Tani, um, one of the questions, and I'll ask it to all of you, is that we focus on children and vulnerable adults, but as Mari and others have, have raised, is any athlete needs to be safeguarded? So how do we do that better? Rather than looking at children, vulnerable adults only, how do we make sure any athlete has the same protection? Yeah, we have to have definitions, but um, I said in my original piece of work, every athlete on a programme has a vulnerability. Yeah. Um, to a, a 
potential abuse of positions of power trust you know so um that vulnerability changes so they wouldn't be a typical definition of a vulnerable adult mm. but actually it's understanding that positions of power so yeah it has to be so positions of trust is just part of a step in the sand because it doesn't stop Mari's saying it doesn't stop the 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 coercion grooming of of anyone over the age of 18 so you know yeah it's there's 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 plenty more that needs to be done in in this space do you believe in permanent bans for coaches who've been found guilty of, of abuse uh, um yes but I, was, I believe in life bans for people who've taken drugs so yes. and and all the associated personnel around them yeah. uh oh, but then you start getting to into rehabilitation and then I also have this quite conflicting view. I think the vast majority of people can be rehabilitated from things that they've done. So, yeah, it's unfortunately it it's the people, the associated personnel rarely get banned, um, yeah. and they they need to to do as well. So, um, yes, but there's always oh, a bit of a caveat to it. Yeah, that's fair. And I think that point about, and I've said this numerous times to journalists and at different talks. You know, we always focus on the abusers, the monsters. Is there actually systematic failings which we need to look at? I think, Mari, you had your hand up, sorry. Oh, I, I, I was just going to add on the kind of lifetime bans for, for coaches found guilty of any type of abuse. In fact, yeah, it, as Tani says, it is. And I probably also have conflicting uh, beliefs in that people can be rehabilitated. But when these types of policies are written into, for example, a coaching licence, People are aware of what they're signing up to. A coach signs that and they agree, they're entering into a contract that if they if they break that um, kind of section within the contract, if they break that clause, that's it. And I do, I do believe that when we are playing with people's safety, well-being, mental health, uh, safety, we can't take risks um, and we shouldn't take risks. The, the risk is too high and it's not just emotional there's not just an emotional cost for that individual athlete. There's an evo emotional toll on everybody around them, their family, friends. And then there's the financial cost on sports, governing bodies, potentially the family. Quite often lawyers get involved, particularly nowadays. Um, and yeah, just the other point I was going to mention was on um, kind of the how to treat adults with the same kind of or including them. Um, the way that UK athletics tend to try and protect adults to the same degree as children is that they, I suppose, officially file it under either a welfare or a disciplinary, but would follow the exact same process um, and then obviously enter into a kind of civil court situation. So there are ways around it, but I suppose, as we would probably all acknowledge, we are trying to navigate a broken system um, and do the best we can with the tools are, that are available to us. And I can see you've got your hand up, Tro, which I'm glad you do, actually. I was going to come to you. Obviously, when we look towards offences of racial abuse and discrimination, um, sometimes you have to go on a rehabilitation course for six weeks, or you may get six match ban if you're Luis Suarez or whoever else. Um, what's your take on all of this, Troy? Yeah, I was just going to contribute by saying I still don't understand what the term zero tolerance means in sport. You know, what does zero tolerance mean? Is it zero tolerance that we condemn it? Is it zero tolerance that we take the right and appropriate action followed by sanctions? And zero tolerance has no substance in my sport anyway. I've got to be totally honest. I hear it put in statements all the time. I hear that there's no room for racism put in statements all the time you know and yet racism continues so actually there is room it exists it's there it's viral um i did an interview before i came on today talking about last night's incident and asked exactly for what we what everyone has just spoken about to be totally honest and that is a lifetime ban yeah. um and then work backwards so i do believe in rehabilitation as well you know and we have to understand that if that person is made aware of the consequences of those actions so the impact that it has not just on, uh, so in this scenario, it's Charleston, his teammates, his family members that would have had to have witnessed it. They may have been in the stadium as well, by the way, um, and had to witness that, um, you know, and the first kind of sanction is, right, you're banned for life. 
and then work backwards. And then, you know, if, if the person shows remorse, if the person goes on that education program, you know, sometimes players want to meet, they want to meet them. And so they want to tell them about the impact of the, you know, that banana yesterday, what it had on them, what it, what the history behind it was. So I, like I said, I don't know what zero tolerance means in regards to player on player. I don't think we've ever got it right. Luis Suarez got eight matches. John Terry got his sanction. We had Casilla, uh, the most recent player on player, I would say that was public, uh, eight matches. And when he came back, he was given the armband. So it was almost like the club was saying, it's great to have you back. We're really sorry that this happened to you, but here's the armband to show that we support you. Yeah. And what does that say to the victim, by the way? You know, so... I've called for longer, much more lengthier bans in, for players who discriminate and for them to go through the same process as well. We shouldn't, you know, if we had eight matches in 2011, why are we still having eight matches in 2022? Why is the severity of the offence and the sanction against it not increased? So mm -hmm. I'm not in a good place with my own sport. And, and that's probably why they, they push me to the side a lot of the time. And you don't see me commentate on these matters a lot more because they don't like me bringing up the obvious. And I think that is the obvious. We yeah. should not be handing out the same sanctions 11 years afterwards because we've still not effectively dealt with the issue. Yeah. So we need to make them stronger. We need to make them more powerful. And we need to protect the people that have been victimized who, because of social media now and the growth there, get victimized again. Yeah. So just the last one on this topic, Glenn Kamara, if anyone can remember the Rangers versus Slavia Prague situation um, where, uh, you know, the, the abuse came in such a, you know, the player went up and whispered in his ear, racially abused him in his ear. Mm. Um, and because no one, I say no one, the Slavia pra Prague fans didn't agree and felt that Kamara wasn't racially abused, he then was racially abused every single day on social media. And I think that still exists now. So for, for nearly two, two years, he's had to go through witnessing stuff on his platforms. Mm -hmm. And yes, look, the player got a 10 match ban. It meant that he missed the Euros and, you know, all of that kind of consequence. But Glenn's still living with that day, that incident at that time. Yeah. What value do you put on that? I think that's the key thing. Um, we're going to do a concluding note, but it goes on to this point in that we can't keep on doing the same thing. We do need change um, and we need to protect the athletes better. Um, I'd be grateful if the team could put up the next set of slides um, talking about what action is needed to better protect um, people and athletes. The first one is it to appreciate and accept that abuse is abuse, full stop. Um, there's no ifs, there's no buts, there's no grey um, area in relation to this, whether it's sexual, physical, emotional, racial, discrimination, neglect, bullying, harassment, intimidation, we need to accept that abuse is abuse and it's unacceptable. Um, we can no longer say that these are low level concerns or that's a bit dodgy. We need to root it out because otherwise it will just grow and develop. Mandatory reporting you've heard about fully support um, the campaign and the work's been done. Hopefully the independent inquiry that's published next month will recommend it. We do then need this um, government to implement it. We need to take the burden off survivors. It doesn't work. It's been going on for far too long. And we need to, again, pick up on what lots of the speakers have said. This is a sport-wide issue. It's not just for survivors to deal with. This issue about apologies is really important. And as you can see, this is it's actually part of a, a statute, a part of a law, whereby apologizing doesn't indicate negligence or breach. And often in the case which I've acted in, whether it's in gymnastics, football, tennis, swimming, the list goes on. Often sorry is the hardest word. And actually saying sorry, and I've done an article on it and I can send it to people if you're interested, it often can take out the pain for survivors. It can make resolution much easier. And it's something which we need to address. It's not us and them. And hopefully by hearing all the speakers today, we're not criticizing sport. We want to work with you to make sport safer because we all love it. And we want to continue down that route. The last one is about a register of coaches, which is really important, whereby not only 
our abusers named. Um, far too often, whether it's in football, athletics or elsewhere, people are being punished, but we don't know about it. There's certain coaches which are out there. Judy Murray said it in tennis and that we just give a nudge to each other. Don't use that coach. And there's other sports like that because it, people are worried. There's current coaches within tennis at the moment who've got convictions, but yet they're still working in tennis centres. I pick on tennis, you can choose any other sport. It's not good enough. And I think picking up from what Troy said and Myrie, the reason why punishments are important is not just for the survivors, not just for the system. Symbols are important. We need to show it is an acceptable. You are not welcome in our sport if you're an abuser. You either change or you leave. It is so key and so important. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is from Anne White, uh, KC, who did a gymnastics review. This is her actual words. You've heard from us. We are interested parties. We are experts in different fields. We want an independent sports ombudsman. And I couldn't think of a better way of saying it. So I just used um, White's quote there. We need to take heed of it. There's been far too many um, inquiries, as Tani said. There's been far too much money spent um, with limited improvement and change. And the independent sports ombudsman means that there's someone who's there, who's independent of that specific sport, who's trained and specialist in that area, similar to Ofsted, like Eloise was mentioning, which can make sure that you are safe in football as much as you are within cricket or tennis or canoeing. It shouldn't be a sport lottery, depending on how they um, operate. And I fully agree with everyone who said that. The next slide, please. Um, the one of the key things I wanted to pick up on was actually inquiries which have been done. A number of people have mentioned them. These are some of the sports, some of them not being published. The Football Association, um, it's an important point to note, is it only looked into sexual abuse. It was 710 pages. Two pages were on women's football, female uh, football. It isn't sufficient and it's not being proactive. It's only being reactive. All of these inquiries are reactive. The British Gymnastics report, which I've, reckon, you know, I've said has been very good, it didn't name any abusers. There was a decision made by the sport. It does mean, again, that abusers are getting the element of protection. The tennis um, inquiry by Quinlan KC noted it had been failures over five years, half a decade. And the reason why these reviews are so important is to identify the failures and to change. Um, Swim England was a, an investigation rather than a review into an individual club. But the reason why I noted it is, again, they identified over, it identifies sorry, 70 allegations of coaches bullying behavior, failure to address welfare, including eating disorders and serious mental health issues. You compare this to gymnastics, swimming, it's the same issue, but in different sports. And that's why, again, the need for an ombudsman is so important. And the last one is that in the review into cricket and the racial abuse at Yorkshire Cricket Club. We haven't seen that in football. Um, I don't know why that is. There is no justification for it. The racial abuse which Azim went through and unfortunately couldn't come today, he's, he's out of the country, but he, um, and he's happy for me to say this, he fully supports the need for an independent sports ombudsman. Because again, when we talk about abuse and safeguarding, we focus on sexual abuse and we disregard all other forms of abuse to a large extent. Um, it's unacceptable. And what we do need is a full review. Independent inquiry, the child of sexual abuse could have done it, they didn't. We do need someone like DCMS to step up and to investigate all sports. And then that's retrospective, but then going forward, we must have a sports ombudsman. We must have manager reporting. We must help survivors. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's a numerous charities out there, which I do note, and these are just some of them, uh, some of the nationwide ones. I would advise all sports to reach out, to provide support. Um, Lots of survivors need therapy, treatment, support, counselling. And I would recommend looking for local charities, looking for specialist charities, and trying to make sure that support and help is available for them. Because again, the focus often is towards one form of abuse rather than others. All abuse survivors deserve that support. Um, and then just last slide, please. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's attended 
Um, please do share this. The hashtag is abuse in sport. Um, we are going to be sharing the slides, um, the, not the slides, sorry, we're going to be sharing the recordings with people afterwards. I appreciate there's lots of questions being posed. Please keep on sending them through. And what we will do is we'll try to answer them. I just wanted to say thank you so much to, to Tani, Troy, Myrie, and Eloise for coming today and for everyone attending. Um, please learn from their experiences, what they've said. Please act and please improve safeguarding for all athletes within sport. Thank you.